we just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, for uh, what you want to teach us. And, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this foundational message that, uh, that w- the students can be able to learn and grow and, and we can just become better men. Yes. And uh, it would be with us today as we teach the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Being a good steward. 18, 18 attributes of a good steward. If you were not here last time, you missed the first three. Um, <clears throat> but a steward, does anybody have their notes from last time? No. Steward. What is a steward? What, how do we define steward last time? The job of supervising or managing something that doesn't belong to you. <coughs> Stewardship also is to is a servant. It's a servant who acts like a ruler. A servant who acts like a ruler in their responsibilities. Okay? Actually, I'm going to say a ruler and an owner. (coughs) I think one of the key characteristics of a good steward is someone who takes ownership of everything around them. This means that they never say, that's not my job. Let me say it again. A steward never says, that's not my job. <clears throat> Obviously, when you're in leadership, you do have to delegate and give responsibilities to other people. So you might say, hey, look, that's not my job. I've delegated that to you. However, what I mean by this is their heart attitude is not, that's not my job. Okay? They do not have a heart attitude that pawns off responsibility. So a, a, that's what a steward is. A steward is a servant who never says that's not my job. And the reason why is because a steward knows that everything is his responsibility. Okay? Um, if the place is falling apart, that's my responsibility, right? If you live here and you've been given the house and things are not clean, it's your responsibility because you've been stewarded. Does that make sense? Uh, the, the, to be a steward is to have something literally given to you. It's handed to you to take care of. Okay? And I'm going to say this. Anything in your life that you have direct influence over is something God has stewarded for you to take care of. Okay? Now, obviously, you can't overcommit and, and, you know, and try to help every single person in the world. And, you know what I mean? You would never be able to do that. Okay? But what you have to ask yourself, what has truly been given to me? What is truly by God, been given to me to take care of, okay, to enhance. And last week we talked about cultivating. uh, Part of a steward is to make things better. Part of a steward is to protect things, okay. Uh, We help carry the burden for uh, for God. It says here we're co-laborers or co-workers with God in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. But we also help carry other people's burdens, right? Number three is love. We love correction. As a steward, we love correction. Oftentimes, when we're given something uh, to put over or manage, uh, we have a hard time receiving correction. What is it? Steward, you're handed, it's handed to you to take care of. Something's handed to you to take care of. All right. Uh, Steward also likes correction, loves correction, because a steward wants to be a wise person, a wise man, love correction. There we go. All right. So this week we're going to be talking about four, uh, at least three other, maybe four other attributes. So we're in part two of the teaching, uh, being faithful with the little is the first one. Okay. So have you ever gone to get a job, you got hired, and someone gave you a task to do, right? Ask yourself, 
what went through your heart when they told you to do something? You know, I remember working at CC's, man, I guarantee you 90% of the time the people had a bad heart issue with anything I told them to do. It's funny because I hired them, but they don't want to do anything I tell them. It's so weird. People are truly lazy. People are truly don't want to do work, you know? Um, and anyone who points the finger at other people and says, man, he just doesn't want to do any work, usually also has a problem with doing work. <laughs> Make sense? Yeah. If you point the finger <laughs> at someone else and say, hey, man, you know, uh, it, there, it, or at least you've struggled with it in the past. Everybody's struggled with, you know, not wanting to carry their weight. You know, everyone has struggled with not wanting to do their job. Yes, sir? I don't mind the work. It's just that I have problems writing sometimes and it discourages me. You know what I'm saying? All right, that's a good point. So I, <clears throat> you're right. There's there's sometimes underlying issues when people um, have work problems. You know, there we might automatically um, attribute it to their work ethic, but it may not be their work work ethic. Maybe they're just discouraged. Maybe they don't feel like they're doing a good job, and so they don't want to embarrass themselves or whatever. You know. Uh, yeah, that's a valid point. I think uh, definitely if you're a leader and you have somebody working for you, it's your job to figure out, is it, do they truly have a bad work ethic or are they just, you know, embarrassed oh, about the quality of work thing? Right. You know, right. You get something out of it. Right. Sometimes people are afraid of failure. Yeah. I'm talking about, not talking about being a failure. I'm talking about failing at something. Yeah, yeah. Failure about messing something up. Yeah, true. not being successful, you know. Right. Uh, I didn't do a good enough job, or I'm going to be ridiculed for this. But the truth is, <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's a concept, you know, especially in the business world, they talk about imperfect action. Always take imperfect action. The reason why is because sometimes we are so worried about messing up that we never do anything. Right? We get in what we call analysis paralysis. I would rather someone try something and fail than sit there and do absolutely nothing because they're afraid of failing. And God is the same way. That's why he does the parable of the talents when he says, oh, I hid the talent you gave me because I was afraid. Right? I knew you reap where you do not sow. I knew you were a hard man reaping where you do not sow. So I just buried it. Right? The guy was afraid of failing. He was afraid of messing it up. He was afraid of not doing a good job. And he knew, he knew that the master was already going to, you know, get his will done anyway without him. So he checked out. Analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis. Okay? And so we get into fear mode. We're afraid to take action. Say it again. We're afraid to take action um, because we're afraid to fail. Okay? Or we're going to mess up or whatever. <clears throat> it's sometimes better just to go ahead and take imperfect action. And then love correction. Yeah. Let me say it again. It's better to take imperfect action and then love correction. You'll get way further ahead if you take imperfect action and love correction. Okay, because you're going to mess up. Make sense? And, we, and then we go back at it, right? It, the, the question is, do you want to please God? Do you want to do a good job? Because if you want to do a good job, you will love correction. Yeah. If you want people to be happy with you, then you won't like correction. Let me say it again. If you want to do a good job, you'll love correction. If you want people to like you, you will hate correction. <laughs> so are we living to please God or please men? Right. That's really the borderline thing. Well, and this, this goes with correction from God or correction from people. Uh, because when we're talking about here, you know, even if you're, if you're submitted to some leader or whatever, the leader's going to correct you. Yeah. Right? So you have to be willing to receive correction from the leader, too, not just God. Um, but, you know, fear of... All right, does that make sense? Cool? Can you say your quote one more time? If you love... If you, if you want to do a good job, you will love correction. Yeah. 
If you want people to like you, you'll hate correction. It's hard, man. And, and that is on a lot of levels, too, what I just said. Because yeah. I love correction, but you know what? Sometimes people correct me and I get my feelings hurt. Um, I've had to learn. I'll, I'll just tell you, I've had to learn um, to be careful about how I approach people. Uh, not, because, not for your sake, but for my sake. Because I want to keep my heart right, and I don't want to come in here mad every day because I see a bunch of stuff piled up. You know what I mean? Um, so what I'll do is I just, I'm trying to feel out where people are. And as I say, okay, you're a leader who needs to go to a higher level of excellence, then I'll address it with you at that time. And, but the problem with that is a lot of people think I'm just being slack. And the truth is I'm just trying to protect my heart because I can come up here mad every day, you know? I do the same thing when I go home. I got six kids, right? Do you think that house is going to stay clean? Heck no, right? So it's a constant correction all the time, right? Anyway. But you have to learn to keep your heart right and, and realize that um, it's not something you're going to perfect. It's these types of things like clean, cleanliness and keeping things in order. It, you're not going to perfect it. You, you'll run yourself in the ground. Yeah. Right? No, you've got to constantly be working on it all the time. Right, right. You know what I mean? So. That's, hence, hence chore time. That's what, that that's what chore time is. Yeah. If we time block out stuff, which I'm learning about. Time block it out, man. You will. You, it's amazing what you'll accomplish if you just time block it out. That's why the schedule has got all these time blocks, you know, on purpose. So that we know that during this time, we're going to knock some things out. You know, it doesn't take too long to do some of that stuff. All right, anyway, we're getting off. No, Faithful good. with a little. Good. <clears throat> all right, so am I making sense? You said a lot there. Um, I don't know if that was any particular point. Um, just, I don't know, is that maybe another point? Okay, <clears throat> y'all good? <laughs> All right, so that was the intro. Uh, <laughs> faithful with the little. This is one of the attributes. Attribute number four, faithful with the little. And you can also see it up here on the, on the TV screen, if that helps you. Romans 4, verse 12. So then each of us, Oh, sorry, Romans 14, verse 12. <clears throat> so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Okay, now, that's true in the heavenly realm, but it's also true on earth. We will give account to those that we submit to in leadership, right? <clears throat> now, people might look at Zach and say, Hey, Zach, you know, you're the boss of the barracks and the ministry, and who do you answer to? I I'm not autonomous. I answer, number one, to God. Secondly, I also answer to our donors. Every, what if, what am I supposed to say to the people who donate to our ministry? You know, at the end of the year, I give a report and I have to tell them what we're accomplishing. You see what I'm saying? So there's not a lack of accountability. The, there's actually the higher you go, the more accountable you are. And the higher you go, the more people you have to answer. Let me say it again. The higher you go, the, you go, the more accountable you are. And the higher you go, the more people you must answer. Okay, if I have a, 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 a team of 100 people who are my employees, I have to answer those people as a leader. Does that make sense? Yeah. You might not think so, but I do. Okay? <clears throat> the higher you go in leadership, the more people you have to answer and the more intense your judgment is from God as well. The Bible says many of you shouldn't be teachers, for you should know that teachers will be held to a higher standard. Right? We are held to a higher standard. <clears throat> this life is something we are to steward and we will give an account. Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. So we're probably not going to get to point five or six because I just realized we're about to read some really big parables. So let's go over to Matthew. 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 Matthew chapter 25. <laughs> I'm sure I have. I mentioned a second ago, actually. Uh, 14. All right, go. Here we go. I just put the, the scripture up on the screen. The parable of the talents. 
For it will be like a man going on a journey who calls his servants and entrusts, you write that word, entrusts them to his property. Do you see that? He entrusts them to his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and to each according to his ability. His ability. What does that mean? That means that God plays favorites. That means that God give. if you're not good at anything, he doesn't give you anything. That means if you do good, he gives you something. Back that up now. <laughs> God don't play favorites. <laughs> well, we know God... There's different explanations for that, right? No, I mean, God does play favorites. He no, clearly no. picked Jacob over Esau. The Bible says he hated Esau in the womb. So there is favorites. Now, you have to understand, now this is kind of a dangerous thing because now we're going to be like, golly, God, why is God choosing favorites? And there's a lot of people that say God doesn't pick favorites. Let me, let me explain a couple I things here. Not really, because they're not really bringing me scripture to prove that you're, he doesn't pr have favorites. You're just associating favoritism with love. He loves everybody the same. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good word. Oh, but, okay, okay, yeah. He loves everyone the I'm same. Let me, let me explain why he loves everyone in the same. He died for his friend, and he died for his enemy. So his friends and his enemy both were given the same ultimate gift of a sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right? Salvation. But the word favor is grace. And if you read the scripture, there's lots and lots of times when some people had more grace. Okay, the Bible said that Stephen had great grace. Well, if he had great grace, then there must be normal grace. Why did he have great grace, and how come I don't have great grace? Okay, so is what you're saying is God gives them that grace, and he expects more from them. Yes, that's true. It's not like he, oh, yeah, okay. So I, I like that, because sometimes people think that when someone has more favor, they get away with more stuff. No. It's actually the opposite. <laughs> the people who have more favor from God usually die quicker when they disobey. There's a prophet that the Bible says There's he went... Yeah, let me, let me read a scripture to you and you can see if you want to be God's favorite or not. <laughs> <laughs> one second. This is a scary one. Uh, yeah. So is there different heavens, levels of heaven then? Like when did the favorites get the VIP tag? Yeah, I am. <laughs> it's going to be 1 Kings chapter 13. This is one of the reasons why we don't want to talk in the middle, because uh, I want to answer your questions and then get off sidetracked. Um, so this last thing I'll say, okay? But I, I feel like I said something that kind of like curled the skin. So uh, let me go. It's all right. It's okay. We'll, we'll, this fits in. I can make this fit in. All right. Yes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And a man, oh, behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you, the priests of the high places, who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. He's talking about the altar. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar will be torn down. And the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying, the man of God, of the man of God, which he cried against the altar of Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar and saying, seize him. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down immediately. So as his hand got crippled, the altar was flipped over and the ashes poured out on the altar according to the sign the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So clearly, this prophet had a measure of favor with God that Jeroboam did not. And he was asking the man of God to, ask to, to heal him, right? 
And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. And the man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place, for so was it commanded to me by the Lord, by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, an old prophet lived in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And the father said to them, Which way did he go? And the sons showed him the way, and the man of God came from Judah, who came from Judah, had gone. And he said to the disciples, I mean to the sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he mounted it and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? He said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that you came. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, Thus says the Lord, because you disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said, You shall not eat bread and drink water. Your body shall come to the tomb of your fathers, or shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And after he had eaten bread and drunk, he settled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was torn or thrown in the road and the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body and didn't even eat it. And behold, the men passed by and saw the body thrown in the, in the road and a lion standing by the body. And they came and told it to the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way of, of it heard of it, he said, it is the man who disobeyed the word of the Lord, which you lied about, you dummy. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid the body in his own grave and they mourned over him saying, Alas, my brother. And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones for the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. All right. <laughs> so here's an example of a man who had favor from God such a way that he was hearing God's voice very clearly, such in a way that he prophesied against Jeroboam, such in a way that when Jeroboam tried to arrest him, Jeroboam's hand got withered up, right? Such, so much favor with God that when Jeroboam and then repented and said, hey, please pray for me and that I'll be healed, then he prayed for him to be healed and he let him go. This man had so much favor with God, but he disobeyed the Lord. And you don't see this happen by believing the lie. with other people. Yeah, by believing the lie. You don't see this with other people in the Bible that are kind of not, not God's favorites. You know, it's the people who are God's favorites, they get harsher punishments and quicker. Right. <laughs> How many of y'all ever tried to serve God, right? You, you started following God, and all of a sudden you couldn't get away with speeding anymore. Cops keep pulling you over. And you're away with nothing. <laughs> right? God has set us apart. And so when he sets you apart, that is a form of grace. That is a form of favor. That's a form of consecration. That's a form of sanctification. Okay? When he sets you apart, the word set apart literally is the word holy. When you are holy, it's not that you're good. It's that you're set apart. The word holy means set apart for sacred use. So think about this for a minute. Think about the things, the items in your home that, if, that are set apart for sacred use. And if you use them for anything that was common, 
you might just throw it away because it wouldn't be worth it anymore, right? Because it was damaged goods. Does that make sense? We are holy because God set us apart. We are, there's a part of us, every one of us has a measure of favor from God. If you want to grow in favor, think about this for a minute. Jesus Christ would be the most favorite one. Wouldn't you agree? Did you know the Bible says that he grew in favor with God as a man? Well, that's bizarre. That's a bizarre thing to say. Jesus, perfect, never sinning. How did he grow in favor? The reason why is because you grow in favor, which is the same word as grace, by being faithful with the little. If you're faithful with the little, you will grow in favor with God and you'll grow in favor with man. And he'll give you... And he'll give you more. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> so let's get back over here. You guys back over here into the parable of the talents. That's not the NIV Bible, huh? This is the ESV. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's slightly different. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Cool? Y'all got all that? Yes, sir. It was a long Bible uh, little thing, but it was good because it was about the favor of God. And um, a steward is someone God's given favor to. A st- God, we've all been given favor. Okay? There, we've all been given what's called unmerited favor. And then there's the favor that's not merited. That's not unmerited. You do have to merit it. And that's what we're talking about here. As you grow in stewardship, God gives you more. That is a form of favor. He's giving you more grace. This is the reason why, <clears throat> and how do I know that? Um, I have other teachings. We're not going to get into this. I have other teachings that talk about this, about grace, and how there's three ways to get grace through knowledge, humility, and by faith. Right. Right. <clears throat> I have other teachings that go into more detail about this. So you can watch Faith Trump's Giftings or something like that. And I'll go into much more detail about it. But knowledge, humility, and faith. When you know more, you can grow in more grace. Because if you don't know, have you ever been on a buffet line before? Got to the end of the buffet line and they had bacon. You're like, oh no, why'd I get all this food if I'd known there was bacon? Right? That makes sense? <laughs> so, of course, some of y'all are like, there's always room for bacon. Um, uh, it's just a strip, right? <laughs> no, but my point is, have you ever gotten in the, in the buffet line? The pot, you go to potluck dinners with your church or whatever and everybody brings all their stuff and you just keep piling stuff on. You're like, golly, there's so much here. I wish I had more plates. And that's grace, Okay. <clears throat> without knowledge, you can't make room for more. Does that make sense? Without knowledge, you can't prepare your heart to receive more from God. Humility is submission. And I think submission is not just, it's, it's, it's yielding. It's obedience. Humility always leads to obedience. You ever heard that phrase, it's not real submission until you and I disagree? Right? Right? We don't agree, but you still obey. That's submission, okay? And then there's faith. Faith is perseverance as well. Perseverance. One of the attributes of faith is that you don't give up. That's why we have, um, have faith in me and be faithful to me. Faithful means I come through also, right? So... Make sense? It's good stuff. Faithful means I come through too. Okay, so if I put faith in someone or something. I'm expecting it to be dependable. But if I'm faithful, that means I'm going to be the one who's dependable. Okay, faithful. So the word faith is, is a two-way street. Okay, makes sense? <clears throat> All right. Let's get back to this one. Let's, let's, try, to, let's try to finish out this... Uh, point of faithful with the little, which is the point we're on. Faithful with the little. <laughs> um, then he went away. Okay, so <clears throat> to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made 
two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Y'all realize that the, the parable of the talents is not talking about your gifts and your talents. It's talking about money. God is a businessman. He's a businessman. <laughs> no, it was their money. The talents, if I'm not mistaken, uh, let me look up the word talent. Parable. It's a great sum of money, okay? So a pair. Like, how much hey, money a, is a, a talent? It tells you how much a talent is. I can look it up. Right? 6,000 denarii. <laughs> okay. A talent was about 75 pounds. No, that's 75 pounds of gold. 75 pounds of gold? So, uh, according to this one here, <clears throat> one gram uh, costs thirty-eight dollars of gold. At this price, a talent, thirty-three kilograms, would be worth about one thousand. No, one million four hundred one hundred one million four hundred thousand one hundred sixteen dollars and fifty-seven cents. That's how much a talent is. One million. It could be. T it could be silver. Uh, so here's the deal, guys. God, uh, God is all, you know, even the guy who had one, that's a lot of talents to dig. <laughs> one talent. He dug one million. He, he buried a million four hundred dollars. Four uh, Golly. A million four hundred thousand. Okay, anyway. He had deceived, or he had received, not deceived, he had received the five, went in at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. Also, he who had two talents made two talents more and the one, but he who had received one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those, I say, after a long time, after a long time, <laughs> the master of those servants came and settled accounts. Everybody say, settled accounts with them. And he who had received. Huh? <clears throat> After a long time. Oh, is God coming back? When is the second coming coming back? After a long time, he settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. So good. You have been faithful over a little. One million four hundred thousand dollars is a little? Uh, to God. <laughs> Think about this for a minute. Five talents. This guy had five. In God's eyes, five million dollars. It's actually be more than that because it'd almost be like seven million dollars, right? Seven million dollars. He goes, <clears throat> you've been faithful with a little. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now that this guy had the most. This guy had the most ability, and he was given more than anybody else, and God called it a little. So whatever you have right now, it doesn't matter if you have a little or a lot, it's still a little. It doesn't matter how big your ministry gets. It doesn't matter how big your business gets, how big your family gets, how big your bank account gets. It's always a little. Always a little. Okay? <clears throat> when you look at somebody else and you're jealous about them and what they have, remember, it's only a little. And they also, too, will give an account. And God will settle accounts with them for what they have. Still obey. That's submission. Okay? And then there's faith. Faith is perseverance as well. It, it, one of the attributes of faith is that you don't give up. That's why we have, um, have faith in me and be faithful to me. 
faithful means I come through also, right? So, make sense? It's good stuff. Faithful means I come through too. Okay, so if I put faith in someone or something, I'm expecting it to be dependable. But if I'm faithful, that means I'm going to be the one who's dependable. Okay, faithful. So the word faith is, is a two-way street. Okay, that makes sense. Let's get back to this one. Let's, let's, try, to, let's try to finish out this uh, point of faithful with the little, which is the point we're on. Faithful with the little. <laughs> um, then he went away. Okay, so <clears throat> to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Y'all realize that the, the parable of the talents is not talking about your gifts and your talents. It's talking about money. God is a businessman. He's a businessman. <laughs> no, it was their money. The talents, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let me look up the word talent. Six thousand denarii. Okay. A talent was about seventy-five pounds. So that's seventy-five pounds of gold. Seventy-five pounds of gold. You know how much an ounce of gold is? Or twenty-eight ounces. So uh, according to this one here, <clears throat> one gram uh, costs thirty-eight dollars of gold. At this price, a talent, thirty-three kilograms, would be worth about one thousand. No, one million four hundred. $1,400,116.57. That's how much a talent is. One million. It feels like a translation called like silver. It could be, it could be silver. Uh, so here's the deal, guys. God, uh, God is all, you know, even the guy who had one, that's a lot of talents to dig. <laughs> one talent. He dug one million. He, he buried a million four hundred dollars. Four uh, uh, golly, million four hundred thousand. Okay. Anyway, he had deceived, or he had received, not deceived. He had received the five, went and at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. Also, he who had two talents made two talents more, and the one. But he who had received one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those, I say, after a long time. <laughs> the master of those servants came and settled accounts. Everybody say, settled accounts with them. <clears throat> After a long time. Oh, is God coming back? When is the second coming coming back? After a long time, he settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. So good. You have been faithful over a little. One million four hundred thousand dollars is a little? That's a lot to God. <laughs> Think about this for a minute. Five talents. This guy had five. In God's eyes, Five million dollars. Actually, be more than that because it'd be almost be like seven million dollars, right? Seven million dollars. He goes, <clears throat> "You've been faithful with a little." <laughs> I'm gonna tell you right now that this guy had the most. This guy had the most ability, and he was given more than anybody else. And God called it a little. So whatever you have right now, it doesn't matter if you have a little or a lot, it's still a little. It doesn't matter how big your ministry gets. It doesn't matter how big your business gets, how big your family gets, how big your bank account gets. It's always a little. Always a little. 
Okay? <clears throat> when you look at somebody else and you're jealous about them and what they have, Ooh. remember, it's only a little. Mm -hmm. And they also, too, will give an account. And God will settle accounts with them. So why don't you pay attention to yourself? <laughs> don't envy other people's stuff. Yeah, you know, when you stand before God on Judgment Day, He's not going to even listen to your complaint about, well, so-and-so had so much more than I did. He's going to say, I know, I gave him more because he can handle more than you, doofus. <laughs> What'd you do with your... He'll say, what did you do with yours? He'll say, we're not talking about so-and-so who had, you know, $10 million in their bank account. We're talking about you. You only had $5 in your bank account. What'd you do with it? You have been faithful over a little. Watch this. I will set you over much. What? So $7 million is a little. So what's much? Enter into the joy of your master. I love it. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 21. <laughs> and he also who had two talents came forward and said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Wow. So I want to point out something to you. God's not going to reward you based off your return. Because one guy made five talents more. One guy only made two talents more. God didn't actually reward him any differently. Yeah. They both got promoted. Yeah, they, both get to enter in. they both got to enter in. Yeah. And they both were given more. Mm. And they both entered the joy of their master. Watch this. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. If in the end, are you worried about what you have or are you worried about what God's going to say about what you have and what you got back from what you had? Enter into the joy of your master. He got the same reward as the one who had five. He also, who had the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. This is the Calvinistic, Calvinist's worst nightmare. <laughs> I knew you to be a hard man. Look at this. So, so scary. Reaping what you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. In other words, God, you're going to save him with or without my help. I don't need to go preach the gospel. <laughs> don't y'all know that none of us lead anybody to Jesus? Only the Holy Spirit does that. Have you ever heard that before? They got moldy money. <laughs> no man can draw us. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, the Bible says, no man can come to me unless the Father draws him. But it also says, how can they hear unless one preaches? So they cannot believe unless we preach. And Paul said, unless I may have a harvest among you. Yeah, so the Holy Spirit's working through you to reach them. Okay? Master, I knew you to be a hard man. And my, my point is, don't misinterpret what you hear people say. People might say, oh, the Holy Spirit leads people. No, He leads people through you. He uses you. Amen. You are a co-laborer with God. Amen. Yeah, you can't take credit, but you also can't sit on the sidelines either. Make sense? Do the work of the evangelist. Do the work. Reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed, so I was afraid. If you don't know who a Calvinist is, Calvinists basically think that God's going to do whatever He wants to do, whether we like it or not. And there's nothing, you know, pretty much your prayers don't matter. The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. And that's exactly what this guy is saying. This is why this is the Calvinist's worst nightmare. Because he's saying here, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you do not sow. In other words, God's will is going to be accomplished with or without me. Yeah, well, He'll also go into the next life without you too. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. <laughs> so bad. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. Slothfulness is equated to wickedness. Slothfulness is laziness. You don't want to get. You don't want to work. You don't want to get off your butt. Wickedness 
slothfulness, they're twin sisters. Well, when you're, when you're lazy, that's when you allow that wickedness to, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. In other words, go find the people who are doing the work and invest in them. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. Wait a minute. Is God a believer in the distribution of wealth? but in the reverse of what man has taught. You notice this, God did not give the poor man the money. He gave the rich man the money. That's weird. <laughs> What's this? So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10. Why? Because God's going to reward the faithful, not the lazy. Let me say it again. God's going to reward the faithful, not the lazy. For to everyone who has been given, who, who has, who, for everyone who has, will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless slave or servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh my gosh. You don't think that's also talking about, I mean, it says talent, so it says specifically that. This like particular... Anything that God has given I think that. Now, you, the thing is, we yeah. interpret it only in English. Yeah. This is not an English word. Yeah. Talent is not an English word. It can't possibly mean your talents and gifts. Yeah. It's talking about Money. responsibility. It's talking about something that belongs to God that God gave to you as an assignment. Which could mean... Money, your gifts of, like, you're teaching us right now. Like, you're being faithful with that, that gift he gave you. Your family. Right. Your so, family, <clears throat> like, it could mean. Yeah. He's really, that. he's really talking about th this money that he gave them. Okay. It says money, and we should take it literal. Yeah. When it says that. But at the same time, it does apply to the other stuff. Well, here's the deal. I think the main. It, 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 it is your responsibilities. It is your assignment. Yeah. <sighs> What is it that God has given you? Your assignment, your responsibility. Screw all the little, you know, things of little talents and stuff. Like, I'm talented at playing the trombone. I'm not supposed to be playing the trombone. I'm talented. You see what I'm saying? Uh, we all have talents. I mean, I play the guitar. I'm a musician. I am using music. But, but that's beside the point. Like, what God, can, can God's assignments and responsibility be manifested in a talent that you have? Yes. But I think we really misunderstand um, the point of the passage when we say talent. Because what that means is, oh, I have a talent. God wants me to go do, oh, I'm really good at trading stocks, so I'm just going to go trade stocks. Yeah, but if you go trade stocks and it doesn't do anything for the kingdom of God, then it's nothing. It's worthless. Because what God's going to assign you has nothing to do with self-gain. It's about what you can gain for the kingdom of God. You're going to bring it back to him. Yeah. And he's going to say, oh, well, you built your own stuff, but that wasn't mine. Yeah. Are we building God's kingdom or are we building our own kingdom? He's going to say, oh, well, that's a worthless kingdom. That's why, let me show you another, let me show you another scripture. <laughs> uh... All right, let's go over to 1 Corinthians. Uh, I think that's the end of that uh, particular. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Watch this. Watch this. Before Him, He will gather all the nations. This is the same place, guys. Hold on. Don't get distracted. Talents. Now He's talking about final judgment. It's, it's all in the same. So let's, let's go a little deeper in this passage so we can understand more about what He's talking. Be before Him. Yeah, we're going to keep going down. Before him will he be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as the shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And he will place on the, the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. 
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to see me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when, and when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So Jesus always told parables in a couple, in like in a group setting to further drive in the point. So what is the talent? It's the people God gave you to minister to. I don't care what level of life you're at. If you're a mother and you have one kid, that's the person God's shown to you. If you're a father and you have, you know, if you're a manager of a store and you have five employees, that's your, thus, mission, field. That's your mission field, right? Everywhere you're at. So notice that he, when he talked about the talent, then he shares another parable, but he's talking about meeting the needs of the least of these. Now, this is not just talking about people who can give something back to you. A least of these, if you want to qualify what a least of these is, a least of these is someone who can't give you anything back. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the, day, for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and, gave, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick in prison, you did not visit me. And they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked, uh, stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer to them, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Now that is scary right there because it fits perfectly with the parable of the talents. They weren't cast into eternal flame because they did something bad. They were cast because they didn't do anything at all. They didn't do anything with their life. Yeah. That's right. They actually were cast into eternal flame because of their negligence of duty. And these will all go in eternal punishment, but they're righteous into eternal life. Look at this. The parable of the talent, the last guy who buried it, is the, are, he is equated to the goats on the left who saw, who did not meet the needs of the least of these. You see what I'm saying? This is the life. Now, now am I going to say we get saved by our works? No. That's where I was going. What is this? A picture of? This is a picture of a, of a life truly changed by Jesus Christ. When you are judged on the final day, you're not going to be you're not going to be let into heaven because of your good deeds. That's why they didn't get cast into hell. Look at this. They did not get cast into hell for their bad deeds. They got cast into hell for their lack of good deeds. Now that's backwards because we always talk about, well, if you sin, you'll go to hell. Well, no, we're already destined for hell because of our sin. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to give us a new life to forgive us of our sin. Now sin doesn't send us to hell anymore. You know why? Because you've been forgiven. Amen. What is he talking about here? He's talking about fruit. 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 Those who are in Christ are not judged by their deeds. They're judged by their fruit. Let me say it again. Those who are in Christ are not judged by their deeds. They're judged by their fruit. Are you truly of the faith? If you are truly of the faith, then you will serve the least of these. You will, if you're truly of the faith, you will not bury your talent. Every church has that problem. I know. Every church has that problem. Yeah. The church. I'm not judging. Yeah. I'm just... <laughs> 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 All right. Actually, it is a judgment. Last thing I'm going to read. Last thing I'm going to read because uh, we ran out of time. Um, yeah, we definitely ran out of time. Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right, here we go. First Corinthians, <coughs> Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I'm in verse 10, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. 
Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day, which is the day of the Lord, the judgment day, the final account we're going to give to him because we have to be faithful with a little for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. Is this on 15 or 10? I'm in verse 13 now. Each one's work will become manifest for the day. For the day will disclose it. I'm in uh, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3, I'm in verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest. In other words, it's going to come up to the light. It's going to be revealed what he did. And then the day, the judgment day, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And the fire, I'm going to say it again, will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, survives, it will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. But only as through fire. Look at this. If anyone worked is burned up, in other words, if you got saved, your foundation is Christ. Amen. And then you build the house after you're saved and it is worthless. Listen, and the house is worthless because you made it out of hay and stubble. Then when the fire comes, it'll burn up your house. And all of the work you did for 20 years in your life will mean nothing. You'll still have the foundation. You will be saved, but you will suffer loss. This is eternal. This is on the eternal side. This is out on that side of heaven. I mean, on that side of the veil, you know? Watch this. But he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Amen. It's going to be painful. <laughs> When you build your life and you go before God, if you, have, if you truly had the foundation of Christ, you'll be saved. But it's going to be extremely painful when you realize how worthless you spent your whole life doing nothing meaningful and nothing for the kingdom of God. You built your own kingdom and it got burnt up in the end. Like what would be the but if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. You know, we're going into heaven. We're going into the next life, I should say, because I don't even like saying we're going to go to heaven because I don't agree with that. I believe that the new heaven, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and God's going to send us back to this earth and we're going to be rewarded in a new earth based off what you did in the previous life. That's true. So yeah, the, the foundation's there. I might be saved, but when I come back in the next life, and am I, am I going to be living in a mansion with a dirt floor? It talks about there's different crowns that we'll get, like a crown. Of I was a little license. exaggerated. My point is, you'll be faith, you'll be you'll be rewarded. Well, okay, well, you might not have a dirt floor because <laughs> Jesus is the foundation. You see what I'm saying? Like what? You, I believe you're going to be building on what you built on here. We'll be put in charge of things that we were established here in people groups, maybe. And like, Your next life doesn't start when you die. It starts now. Amen. You're building now yeah. for the next life. You're preparing now for the next life. Yeah, we're all, if you're in Christ, you're going to get in. But is everything you're building now going to be burned up and you have to start over? I don't, think that the work's, I don't think that the work is over when we die. I think the work is just beginning. God has other purposes for you that is beyond our understanding and is not revealed in Scripture. All we know is God's going to recreate a new heaven and a new earth. And God's going to give you responsibility. Right. What does that look like? We don't know. But we do know God's going to give us more responsibility when we leave this life.
based off of how we handled this life. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. yeah. So there's more work to do. A lot of people think, oh, man, work's the curse. Actually, it's the opposite. The Bible says that God created man and put him in the garden to work it. Work is your purpose, not your curse. The curse is that the thorns came up and resisted the work. You were always created to work. You were always created to do something and build something. You were created to cultivate. You were created to take dead things and make them alive. You were created to do that. That's what cultivation is. You go into the ground, which has nothing in it. You put a seed in it and it grows. You break the ground. There's, there's a work that's involved there. The curse is that you would sweat when you do it. The curse is that the thorns and the thistles would come up. Yeah. The ground would become hard. That's the curse. And there would be pain in childbearing. Yeah. That didn't mean that she wasn't ever supposed to have children. Because now there's going to be pain. And sweat. Mm. Cool. All that's right. That's really good right there, man. That's, that's deep. All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's pray it out. Um, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us a great responsibility on this earth. Father, and we don't want our work to burn up like stubble. Father, help us. You know, like I, we don't know the mysteries of this, and you know, we could have gotten into a lot of stuff about salvation. I just want to read the scripture as it is and allow it to transform my heart. All I know, Father, is that we've been given a responsibility. We must be faithful, and if we're not faithful, then it's not really a good day. So I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, that we'll take it seriously the responsibilities that you've given us and that we will be faithful with the little in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, the, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your newsfeed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sew into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boulder's Line Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also going to be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day